All right, guys, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about um, microorganisms, which just means super, super small organisms. We'll be talking about how those relate to larger organisms. And then we'll be talking about what does it mean to be alive? Because sometimes we get a little confused, especially with viruses like the coronavirus, our anchor phenomenon. Um, is it alive or not? Like we say, we killed the virus, but what does that even mean? So we'll talk about all of that in today's video. Okay, so things that make something alive. All right, so later we're gonna have to make a determination whether or not a virus is alive or not. So we need this information first. So these are traits that all living things have to share, like they have to do the entire list. So all living things have to be made of cells, okay? Well, dead things can be made of cells too, but they have to be able to reproduce. Dead things can't do that. Um, they have to have information stored as DNA. They have to respond to their environment, grow and develop. So that means that you have to be able to replace damaged tissue. You have to be able to get bigger. Um, we don't tend to just, what's the word? We don't just pop out a fully grown adult, like you start as a baby and you grow and you develop. So everything does, every living thing does that in some kind of way. Um, they maintain homeostasis and they need materials and energy. So they have to eat, basically. They have to get it from somewhere. Okay, so actually one more thing on here, especially for those of you taking notes, a cell is the smallest unit of life. So that's the smallest we can get and still meet all of these criteria. Um, so that's something we're gonna have to look at is our virus is made of cells, okay? So a pathogen. So a pathogen is anything that causes disease. So pathogens are all that's in the news right now. That's kind of why this is the last lesson of this unit. Wow, it's the last lesson, guys, you made it to unit one. Um, but it's, we talk about I don't know, you hear about Corona and about the common cold and flu and all of those things. Those are all pathogens because they all cause diseases. So in this video today, we're gonna focus on bacteria, fungi, and viruses. And just a warning, um, there are some kind of gross pictures in this presentation. So if they make you uncomfortable, just you know, minimize the video or whatever so you don't have to look at it. It is a little rough. Okay, so bacteria, they're prokaryotic. So pro rhymes with no. That means they have no nucleus. So I'm going to be perfectly honest. I don't remember if we talked about this or not because it's been like two or three weeks. But just in case, I think we did. Prokaryotic means they are simple. They're older. They don't they don't have their DNA wrapped up in a nice tidy nucleus. They don't have membrane bound organelles like an endoplasmic reticulum or Golgi bodies. They don't have any of that. So we often find bacteria from animals or the environment. So I hate to break it to you, but bacteria is literally everywhere all the time, on your body, on every surface you touch, everywhere. Uh, we treat these and only bacteria get treated with antibiotics. I promise you that's on your unit test. Make sure you write that down. Only bacteria get treated with antibiotics. Okay? So there's three main shapes. We have bacillus, spirochetes, and coxa. So based on this picture, on our slide, we can tell this is a bacillus. This is what they mean by rod shape. They're not perfectly straight, um, but they're, you know, look kind of like a stick you find, you know, on the ground. So a spirochete is going to look like a corkscrew. This is going to be diseases like syphilis or spirochetes. And cocci, like if you've ever heard of like streptococcus or staphylococcus, like a strep or a staph infection, that, that last part, the cox, staphylococcus, that means it's a it's a coccus bacteria, it's a cocci. I, Y'all are probably giggling if you're actually watching this video. That just means that they're little balls. Um, strep is usually like two little balls stuck together. It just, it is what it is. Um, staph is usually like a cluster of like grapes. So bacteria can be aerobic or anaerobic. And 
it's kind of cool to get to talk about this because this is actually my favorite, favorite, favorite subject in biology is microbiology. So some things need oxygen to survive. We know that, but some bacteria actually cannot handle oxygen. Literally oxygen kills them. So we tend to find these in the dirt a lot of times. So tetanus, um, botulism, what's the other one? There's a, a type of gangrene. This is like a whole, you've heard of like a genus and species, right? So like a genus of bacteria that is an example of this is um, clostridium. I think like claustrophobic, like there's no air, like you can't breathe, right? So the clostridia is they all, if you expose them to air, they die. So that's why you have to, when you like can fruit or vegetables, you have to make sure you get all the air out and then you have to cook it afterwards just to make sure you got both those guys out of there. Okay, here's the gross pictures that I promise you. So strep throat and staph, they're definitely bacterial illnesses. So if you come into the doctor presenting these, they are definitely gonna give you antibiotics. So tetanus, is also bacterial. Um, I didn't put an actual photo of tetanus on here because as gross as these are, there aren't really any school appropriate like terminal cases of tetanus for me to show you. If you're feeling so inclined, you can Google it later. Um, but yeah, this is some, tetanus is related to like what they make Botox out of. Botulism or Botox is also a clostridia. So tetanus makes your muscles seize up. Um, so when someone dies from it, their backs usually bowed up like they can't unclench their muscles. And um, there's a drawing from the Civil War of someone who died of this. Their back was bowed like while they were laying down and they died, obviously. Um, but it's, it's a rough way to go. So Botox does the, or botulism does the opposite. It makes the muscles relax and you can't make a move, which is a problem because, you know, your heart and your lungs are controlled by muscles. Yeah. Okay. Viruses, the man of the hour. So we've been talking about viruses all in the mail, not the mail, the news. I apologize. So viruses are infectious particles. So notice don't say cells. We say particles made from DNA or RNA wrapped in a protein coat. They require a host to reproduce. So viruses, they can't reproduce on their own. So this picture right here, I kind of want you to take a second and appreciate this. This is a cell being attacked by viruses. What you're seeing, the little round parts, I guess, that is the protein coat where all the DNA is stored. So they're trying to inject that into the cell. And you can kind of see the wispies inside the, the, the cell, inside the circle. That would be viral DNA that's already been injected. So since it requires help to reproduce, it's not doing that on its own. It's not a cell. Viruses are not alive. This is on your unit test, okay? A virus is not alive. It doesn't do all those things. Um, so when we say we're killing a virus, you're not really because they were never alive to begin with. We just want to inactivate them and make them not infectious anymore. That's why we use things like chlorine when we clean to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Remember that chlorine um, is negative, like a, it makes negative ions a lot. So it can denature those proteins that are around the virus and it can destroy it. So viral diseases. The common cold, corona is a virus. So that's why they can't just send you to the hospital and give you antibiotics for corona. It's not a bacteria, it's a virus. So the cold, um, herpes, like cold sores and chicken pox are also herpes. So y'all can stop that giggling. I know the three people watching this video are doing. Um, we don't really have time for me to get super into this. Maybe at the end of the school year, if we have extra time, I'll do another video where we get super into diseases because that's my favorite thing in the whole world for some reason. Um, but Ebola, herpes, and common cold are definitely examples of viruses. So fungi, I, bet, I don't know if you knew, but those can make you sick too. Like literally they can infect you. So they're eukaryotic, meaning that they have a nucleus and they're heterotrophs. So hetero means different and trophic has to do with eating. So they need to eat 
different stuff. They have to get their food from something other than themselves. On the other side of it, like a plant is an autotroph, meaning they get their food by themselves. They do photosynthesis. So a fungus can be unicellular, which means one cell, like um, yeast, or multicellular, like a mushroom. So when they infect people, though, they're usually skin or lung infections. So <laughs> grossing you out some more, athlete's foot and ringworm are both classified as fungal infections. So when you get ringworm, you don't take antibiotics. You have to put a special cream that's specifically antifungal, not antibiotic, because um, since they have those nucleuses, it's going to be a different category of chemicals that will have anything to affect them, if that makes sense. All right, so antibiotics. They're chemicals that kill or slow the growth of bacteria and only bacteria. There are antivirals and antifungals, but they're different. They're a different like, category of medicine. So some antibiotics are actually produced naturally by bacteria and fungus. So that's how we got, um, like you've heard of like vancomycin, uh, what are the other ones? But anyway, those ones you see, M-Y-C-I-N, at the end of the name of the antibiotic, that root comes from fungus, like a myconid is a fa fancy word for a mushroom. So all of those originally came from bacteria. And actually penicillin, we got that because someone let mold grow on a Petri dish and they found out that it killed bacteria that way. Fun fact. So antibiotics can kill bacteria, but not animal cells because animal cells don't have cell walls. Some bacteria actually have cell walls. And these antibiotics, they can interrupt those cell walls. They can tear it apart or make it to where they can't get food in or out. It does something like that to them. So when we overuse antibiotics, that can be bad because we actually trigger evolution in those bacteria. So when we get to ev the evolution unit, I'm actually going to show you a video that's a, a time-lapse video of evolution happening. It's pretty cool. They, they basically forced antibiotic resistance to develop in a bacterial colony. Anyway, we'll get there. All right. So we've heard a lot in the news about how they're trying to find people who have already had corona because they want to um, use their antibodies to help other people recover. And they also want to make a vaccine to try to prevent people from getting sick. So for this last part of this lesson, we're going to talk about the immune system a little bit, which we should have hit on um, earlier this week. And we're going to get a little bit more specific in how those vaccines are able to help us. Okay. So passive immunity is nonspecific. It's transferred via DNA, so like your DNA that you get from your parents. And it can happen without a person being exposed to a pathogen. So what this means is there are certain types of immunity in your body that they work for everything. So like your skin. Your skin doesn't care if it's a bacteria or a virus or what. It's just a natural barrier that is there to prevent things from getting in your body. And also, there's some of your types of white blood cells. They're not specific to any kind of pathogen. They're just looking for things that don't have the, the right markers. Like, the right, they're not wearing the right game colors, okay? They don't look like they belong here, so we're going to go get them. And that's how your immune system works. So active immunity, though, is specific. So after you've already, like, after the passive immunity has failed, and you have an infection and you develop antibodies, active immunity or specific immunity is able to happen. So this is a response made for a particular pathogen. Um, so it occurs after your immune system has encountered something usually. Um, and this process has to start over every time something mutates. So if passive immunity is more like a wall or a fence, active immunity is like a wanted poster. So I already know that whatever thing is up to no good, so whenever I see it, I'm going to attack it hardcore. All right, so antibodies are part of the active immune system. So we've heard about this with corona. So B cells make it in response to a specific antigen. So they will see something on the bacteria, like um, it's a specific protein marker. Think of it like um, 
when you're, you're talking to the police or something, you might mention a specific physical trait of the perpetrator so that you can tell the police and they can recognize it. So these B cells are getting a piece of that bacteria when they're markers or something, and they're able to make an, ant an antibody that will bind to that. So antibodies are made in response to an antigen. I want you to write that down if you're taking notes because that's for sure on your unit test. So antibodies are made in response to an antigen. Okay, so antibodies are made by your body. Okay, and gen means to create. So when I see an antigen, I create an antibody. Okay, so right here, we have a picture of a cancer cell. So actually, your immune system is sometimes able to recognize when a cell is cancerous. It's putting up the wrong, um, the wrong markers. So the immune system can create antibodies or sometimes when they treat cancer, they can create those antibodies to get your immune system to attack the cancer, which is pretty cool. Okay, so vaccines. Um, we have talked about vaccines in CERs. So all a vaccine is, is a substance that contains an antigen, all right? So by doing this, we put like a little piece of whatever into your body. So your immune system doesn't have to wait to get a full infection to make an immune response. So we, we mentioned wanted posters, right? So when I use a vaccine, I'm basically handing a wanted poster to my immune system. I'm like, hey, if you ever see this, you need to you know, arrest them or pick them up or whatever. So that's exactly what they do. Um, we don't have to wait for the, the disease to come in and do something bad. They're already on the lookout for it. So vaccines cause an immune response without causing illness. So there's a lot of misinformation out there, like they have mercury, they have poison. So thimerosal actually isn't even in most vaccines anymore. They took it out. That's not there. But what vaccines do contain, um, there's like four different types. Sometimes they have whole dead bacteria or viruses, like they made it to where they're inactive, but they're, they're whole, they pull things in there. This can create some pretty strong immunity. Sometimes there's a weak living ones. This is called attenuated. Um, there's certain diseases this works best for. Sometimes I think that's the flu vaccine. So what they do is they basically find a weaker version that's not gonna make you sick, but it still looks enough like the bad one that your immune system can basically have a practice run. Sometimes they just give you a part of a pathogen with an antigen on it. So they basically like boil the bacteria and break it up and then put just a certain part, like certain little pieces of it in there. And then also you can have inactivated bacterial toxins. So this is part of the Tdap one, I believe. I think it's diphtheria, like that's the D in Tdap. Um, the toxins usually what gets you, so you have to get your immune system ready to deal with it. And so that's part of that particular vaccine. So this is just a meme to close our lesson with. Give you a minute to appreciate that. So I hope you guys learned some new stuff about diseases and pathogens. Please let me know if you have questions and I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care.